Chapter 1. The Stuff Which Dreams Are Made Of Snow whipped over the Antarctic tundra, icy twisters dancing across the plain, around and between two utterly incongruous objects standing there. Two police telephone boxes. Obviously just one would have been perfectly normal, but two? Now that was remarkable. Both boxes looked identical to the casual observer although any slight differences in scale or detailing would have been hard to discern through the swirling flakes filling the air around them. However, if one moved closer to the doors of the leftmost of these blue cabinets, it would have become noticeable that the doors were ever so slightly ajar. If one peered through this crack, one's brain might somersault at the impossible vision beyond. The space within was clearly disconnected from the space without, the former being far larger than the latter would seem to allow. This impossible space within space was also quite obviously a control room of some sort, pristine white with circular roundels set into the walls and a large control console set into the centre of the room. However, there was one object within this room which did not quite seem to fit the decor, a large gunmetal grey box, perhaps the size of a spacious double wardrobe, very industrial in appearance. It seemed to have been pushed roughly against one wall with a certain degree of haste and lack of precision, judging from its slightly askew angle. There was a door set into the front of this device, heavy duty, almost like an airlock from a space freighter, complete with keypad control unit. Set at around head height into this door was a roughly half-meter square window, but that which lay beyond was entirely obscured by what looked like condensation. Rivulets of water scored jagged veins down this surface, but steam further clouded the view inside. This view was enlivened sporadically by flashes of yellow and orange, almost as if lightning were playing within the enclosure. Above the door was a peeling, stenciled sign in an ancient tongue which simply read, Decontamination Shower. The door burst open with a rush of steam and trickling fluids, the figure of a man spilling through it to land clumsily on the floor on all fours. This figure raised his grey-haired head and gave an almost animal cry of anguish and confusion. Then, as he looked around him, his pained expression gave way to one of abject horror. What the hell is this? He exploded furiously and scottishly. This, being the main console room, had a bizarre appearance, at least to anyone familiar with it, and yet it was somehow also familiar, to anyone bizarre enough to know it. It still sported a two-tier design, gantry at a higher level where the main doors lay with stairs leading down from there to the central area of the previously mentioned console but this was where the similarity with the doctor's most recent recollections ended abruptly. The first problem the doctor was having was just how bright everything had become. Every wall, stair and banister was a brilliant and unforgiving white. Each wall was decorated with sunken circular roundels, an aesthetic he was obviously familiar with but not for a very long time, and not on such a scale. The main console itself was a similar mind-bending contortion of old and new, in a sickening collision of style and size. Its proportions were of the imposing, looming vastness with which he was familiar, but the panels and switches were of a much flatter, less baroque, more brutalist nature. The slowly pumping central column, while vast, now had what appeared to be flat perspex sides encasing strange rods and plates of metal and glass. It was reminiscent of some terribly hip and groovy modern art installation set into undulating motion. Clearly someone had left the motor running, even if not in gear. The doctor could sense no signs of travel. It was from behind the imposing bulk of the main console assembly that the figure of a white-haired elderly gentleman moved into view. He walked with an unhurried gait, arms held behind his back. This, the first doctor began with an air of weary patience, is your TARDIS. Is it? The doctor snapped back, gesturing around him. Are you sure? Even as the last words left his lips, fresh confusion, even horror, seized his features and his hands leapt to his throat and began to feel around in alarm. The first doctor either did not notice the doctor's change in behaviour or chose to ignore it, electing instead to take his question at face value. Yes, well, I shall always think of it as mine naturally, but yes, this is the TARDIS contemporaneous to you. My TARDIS is nearby. I understand your confusion, though. The first doctor paused, gesturing around him looking for all the world like a conductor receiving applause. I do hope you don't mind, but I took the liberty of redecorating a little. It was all so dark, baroque and, well, unnecessary. 
However, I left the layout and dimensions set in accordance with your current grandiose fetishes. The doctor continued to clutch at his neck during this slightly condescending explanation, and indeed appeared to be utterly oblivious to it. I'm still Scottish, he cried incredulously. His eyes widened still further. And a man, he continued, almost yelling. Perhaps due to his systematic bent, the first doctor decided to deal with the questions in order. Are you Scottish? I don't recall ever being that good with accents. I must say that in the somewhat limited interactions we have had, you always sounded to me a little like that incarnation of ours with the floppy hat and ridiculous scarf. Nonsense, the doctor spat back. I've never sounded like that. The first doctor shook his head in disappointment. That is an absurd statement, not worthy of us. The doctor shook his own head in irritation, dismissing this admonishment from his earlier self with a pa. The first doctor now turned to the second question. And of course we assemble a human. But if you'd care to check your pulse, I think you'll find yourself quite, quite time lord. The doctor fixed the first doctor with a hard stare. That is not what I meant, he said slowly through clenched teeth. No. No. What then? I thought I regenerated into a woman. This time it was the first doctor's turn to show surprise. He even gave a rare single explosive laugh. Ha! How ludicrous! The doctor looked somewhat ruffled by this response, and his tone was more than a little indignant and defensive when he responded. Ludicrous? What reason would you have to say that? The first doctor frowned and looked considerably unimpressed with his future self. Reasons, you say? Oh, let me count the ways. Firstly, I do not recall ever harboring a desire to be anything other than who I am, sex-wise, I mean. Never once caught myself wishing Susan could call me grandmother, nor even for a moment experienced the desire to learn the art of sucking eggs. The first doctor held up a finger to forestall an anticipated interruption from his older self. I know we change from regeneration to regeneration, but there is a certain core which remains no matter how far you may wish to run from it. To run from yourself, he said, pointing at the doctor. Secondly, he continued, again cutting off the doctor's chance to respond, have you any idea how difficult it would be to achieve such a sex change? Well, the doctor began, the sheer number and complexity of treatments prior to transition would be highly disruptive to the business of everyday life, the first doctor went on. It would be time-consuming, requiring many resources, and would be difficult to conceal from others if someone were to conceal both the desire and the process of such a transformation. Not only would the transformation be a little unusual, but to conceal it would put it into a whole new category of oddity. Imagine, say, if some high-ranking official on Gallifrey had been conducting pre-transition procedures in secret for their own peculiar reasons. What if they were then struck down in the course of their duties and regenerated in front of some hapless palace guard? Can you imagine the confusion and bewilderment on the face of this poor guard, utterly unprepared for this most atypical and difficult of regenerations? He would be completely thrown by it. The doctor's eyes narrowed as he regarded the first doctor suspiciously. That's an awfully specific example, he said slowly. Is it? The first doctor responded innocently. I'm sure it's purely hypothetical. The doctor remained unconvinced but for the moment had nothing to add. My point is, the first doctor ploughed on, that unless you had a strong, innate desire to effect such a change, or some desperate need to conceal your identity, at these last words the doctor's eyes narrowed again. There would be absolutely no reason for you, or any other Time Lord, to undergo a sex change regeneration. They are anything but spontaneous, after all. The doctor stared at the floor, but his eyes were elsewhere lost in the jumbled images within his mind. But it all seemed so real, he offered softly. That Cyberman weapon blast had done a lot of damage, a more dirty weapon than usual. Not intentional, I think. It just appeared a particularly crude and archaic type. It certainly seemed to be interfering with your regeneration more than it should, and this no doubt extended to our mind as well. But did it really seem so real to you? asked the First Doctor. I thought I was a woman new clothes, new companions. And you explored, had adventures, new and exciting experiences. Well, not really, it was all a little prosaic. So, not like reality at all then. Our reality, I mean. We are always at the center of something challenging and unexpected, are we not? 
The doctor again looked more than a little defensive, a part of him still clinging to the dream, the imagined life he had led. Well, not always, he countered. Sometimes we have periods where not much happens, sometimes years, sometimes decades. Yes, the first doctor responded. But we don't talk about those times, do we? Those are not the tales told in song throughout time and space, are they? But still, this life you saw, was it fun at least? The doctor looked crestfallen. Not really. So not our reality at all, then. Nothing but a fever dream, the first doctor concluded briskly. The doctor shrugged in stunned resignation but said nothing. Then he caught sight of himself partially reflected in one face of the console's central column, gray hair and craggy features instantly recognizable and familiar. I am me, he cried once again animated. The first doctor pursed his lips. I have to say this regeneration of yours is particularly fond of facile, or at the very least poorly thought through statements. Who else would you be? The doctor glared at his first self once again. And you are still as irritating and pedantic as ever. You know damn well what I mean. I am still me, my twelfth body. I did not regenerate. The first doctor stared at the doctor. Yes, yes you did. You just didn't change your face. I have no idea why you elected to keep this one. Perhaps it is symbolic. Maybe you felt you had unfinished business. In any case, it is not without precedent. You have burned regenerations and kept the face before. For vanity, perhaps. And it seems somewhere along the line, vanity also drove us to start lying about our age, at least in terms of numbers of regenerations. Are you the 13th, 14th, 15th? Who can say? If we go purely on looks, as seems to befit your character these days, we might as well simply go on calling you the 12th, if you like, if it makes you happy, irrespective of the truth therein. The 12th doctor shook his head in resignation. Just tell me what happened. The first doctor inclined his head in acknowledgement of the request. With pleasure. But first, perhaps you might like to get dressed. The twelfth doctor looked down in horror. Why am I naked? You just got out of the shower. What did you expect? It's not like there's anything I haven't seen in the future. Your clothes are in the cleaning unit in the dressing room. I suggest you recover them before I recount events, at least those I am privy to. With this, the first doctor proffered a pair of Doc Martin boots to the twelfth doctor which he snatched angrily from his earlier self, and holding them around waist height, he stormed from the main console room into the corridor beyond. The first doctor remained in the vast alabaster cathedral of the control room, wandering around admiring his modest remodeling. Occasionally he would stop and frown, wondering if he should have altered more before shaking off such fruitless indecisiveness. He noticed a slight breeze and looked up towards the main doors, he tutted to himself, then flicked a switch to fully close them. He resumed his wandering. His train of thought was broken by another yell, coming now from the corridor to the dressing room. What the hell is that? The first doctor strutted slowly in the direction of the commotion. A short way from the main console room stood the twelfth doctor, between two doors on opposite sides of the corridor. He was now dressed in a rather sharp black suit with thin lapels and collar complete with cream shirt and the Doc Martins he had received earlier. The door behind him was the dressing room from which he had recovered the other items. It was the door in front of him, however, to which he was currently pointing in alarm and disgust. The first doctor walked up alongside him and peered down the length of the older doctor's arm into the space beyond. Indeed, space was the only appropriate label for the eye-wrenching vision before them. There were walls, floor and ceiling just beyond the opening of the door itself, those surfaces to left and right complete with roundels, those above and below flat and featureless, all white barring the shadows within the roundels themselves. But it was the shape of this space which twisted the mind and gut. In some sense it was a little like being inside a banana being peeled. If bananas were cuboids, the banana invisible, and the peel infinite in extent in one direction and bounded by a door at the other. In other words, utterly unlike a banana. Equally impossibly the sides of this hyperbolic space peeled off not into inky blackness, but infinite glorious light, in spite of the impossibility of this, given its geometry and presumably finite lifespan. The twelfth doctor glanced sideways away from his outstretched finger at the first doctor, still awaiting a reply. Well, while I was touching up the interior design, particularly your bloated main console room, 
It struck me that you might be concerned about other space issues such as storage, so I created this little locker for you. I'm sure it will come in handy. The first doctor explained, more than a touch of mockery to his voice. Come in handy, the twelfth doctor exploded incredulously. You could store a planet in there. Oh, and much more besides, the first doctor agreed, but then again it would hardly be the first time. The twelfth doctor rounded on his younger self. That's it. I wasn't sure before, but now I am convinced. You have been looking at your future history, my history, you irresponsible young fool. Naturally, I had to see what had happened to you most recently to try to ascertain the most appropriate course of treatment. But you know me and books, how I hate to put them down, particularly history. I may have browsed on through one or two chapters, the first doctor conceded airily. But you make too much of it, rest assured. How can you say such a thing? You know how dangerous it is for any being, but especially us, to know our own future. The temptations and the potential harm are beyond measure. With a myriad possible do-overs, you could smash space and time into a thousand pieces. Well, we certainly wouldn't want to risk anything like that happening, would we, hmm? The first doctor responded archly. However, he continued swiftly, you should have no fear of that on my part, as you yourself are evidence. What do you mean? The twelfth doctor bristled. In my limited experience with any of my future selves, the first doctor answered confidently. They always seem to have the most appalling memories. Senility, I suppose. They never seem to remember our encounters, and indeed several have openly admitted gaps in their, or should I say my memory. The fact that you do not remember me perusing our archives should be more than enough to put your mind at rest in this regard. The first doctor paused here, stretched a little and winced slightly. In addition, from the feel of things, I doubt I shall be continuing in this regeneration for much longer anyway. The twelfth doctor looked far from pleased or entirely convinced, but let out a weary sigh. Fine. Well, perhaps you would do me the courtesy of explaining how I fell out of a shower having just regenerated into a carbon copy of my former, granted young and handsome self. Before you, yourself, shuffle off this mortal coil, I mean. Of course, my dear fellow, but perhaps we would be more comfortable discussing this in the main console room. I've always felt more at home there, don't you? Just as they were about to leave, the Twelfth Doctor's insatiable curiosity got the better of him, and he put his hand upon the arm of his younger self to stay his departure. Just one more thing. How is it there is light in the distance in that room? By all the laws of physics, the furthest reaches should be a black and unknowable expanse. The first doctor chuckled. Ah, well, yes, you might think that. But you see, I ordered a matter-dominated universe, indeed just the kind of matter you and I, and many other species besides, might survive in. In other words, an atmosphere. The light comes from a unique biome I also installed. In this case, airborne, bioluminescent, microscopic algae and other organisms. Close by you would not notice them but with increased distance their cumulative effect is quite glorious, don't you think? The twelfth doctor allowed the first doctor one curt nod of recognition. Together the two doctors now walked back into the main console room. The twelfth doctor glared at the decontamination shower, which had been so unceremoniously dumped there. I'm afraid I asked the TARDIS to move that out of storage in something of a hurry. Here, let me send it back, the first doctor said helpfully reaching towards one of the panels on the main console. Get away from that, the twelfth doctor snapped, slapping the first doctor's hand away. It's my TARDIS, I will put it back, he continued imperiously. His authority was undercut somewhat by the moment of confusion as he tried to get to grips with the recently rearranged controls. Then with a satisfied nod he flicked a switch. With the gentlest of murmured wheezes, the shower faded in and out of existence twice before vanishing for good. Now the Twelfth Doctor continued. Where did you move the interior chameleon circuit adjuster to? The First Doctor pointed to another panel a quarter clockwise around the console from the Twelfth. But I'm afraid it became damaged during the last alteration, he cautioned. The Twelfth Doctor strode around to examine the controls for himself. He bent and peered closely at one lever in particular. There appears to be something jammed into the selector lever, he said, glancing up accusingly. The first doctor said nothing. The twelfth doctor resumed his examination, 
he looked up again more sharply. It appears to be the blade of a butter knife, or rather, the end of the blade of a butter knife. It seems to have been snapped off quite forcibly. The first doctor held up a finger, but accidentally. The twelfth doctor strode further round to confront the first face to face. You just can't help yourself, can you? You just have to try and reassert your old ideas, your old persona, your old aesthetic upon your future selves. You always have to stick your oar in. The first doctor inclined his head very slightly in the merest of concessions. Well, I am always with you, whether in the flesh, so to speak, or not. The twelfth doctor wheeled round and took a few steps away. It looked for all the world like he might be stifling the urge to hit his younger self. The first doctor coughed and pointed to one of the walls. Well, I did leave you that at least. Attached via a wall mount hung the doctor's electric guitar. The twelfth doctor gave an ostentatious bow. How gracious of you, was his sarcastic response. Then his visage darkened, becoming more serious. He drew himself up to his full height. Tell me what happened, he requested simply. The first doctor began to pace slowly about the console room as he started his tale. Well, I had just stepped out onto the Antarctic tundra, my companions all sleeping as it happened, when I heard another TARDIS, your TARDIS, land very close to me. You stumbled out, collapsed onto all fours, and appeared to be in the throes of a regeneration. However, even though I lack personal experience in this area, I could tell something was wrong. This was no normal healthy process. I walked to you. It seemed you saw me, though I cannot be sure. At this, the twelfth doctor interrupted. I saw you. At least I think I did. In my dreams, he said with quiet introspection. The first doctor nodded, then continued. Then you passed out. So, not wishing to disturb or confuse my companions, I dragged you back inside your TARDIS to render what care and assistance I could. You? Carried me in here? the twelfth doctor asked in disbelief. I said I dragged you in here, and while this body may be on its last legs, it is still that of a time lord. You of all people should not underestimate its power. As the twelfth doctor's interruptions seemed to have been quelled, the first doctor ploughed on. As I mentioned before, the blast you had received from the Cybermen seemed a particularly messy weapon. Whether by accident or design it is hard to say, but the results were obvious. It was seriously disrupting the course of your regeneration. So I just called up the decontamination shower, programmed the appropriate regeneration scrubbers and filters, et voila, one new, or if you prefer, old doctor. The first doctor finished with almost a flourish. He then adopted a slight look of concern. I am sorry about the hallucinations you suffered. It was quite beyond my control. Your body's attempt to make sense of this disrupted scrambled regeneration and its subsequent unscrambling. But as you yourself conceded, it was all just a dream. A nightmare, it seems, the twelfth doctor grumbled sourly. Quite, said the first doctor briskly, but all's well that ends well, and it seems our meeting too has run its course. My work here is done, and I really should return to my TARDIS before my companions awaken. With this, the first doctor began walking towards the stairs leading to the exit. Then he stopped, accompanied by a barely perceptible crunching sound, and turned back to the twelfth doctor. He reached inside his Edwardian jacket and withdrew a tube with a smaller tube attached, atop which sat a couple of circular parts fused together looking for all the world like a pair of licorice all sorts melted together on a hot summer's day. I almost forgot, he said absently. You might find this useful. I discovered it in a store cupboard while you were in the shower. The twelfth doctor looked at it with disdain, yet took it from the first to examine it more closely. This isn't mine, he said dismissively. No, the first doctor conceded. It belongs to my third or fourth incarnation, I believe, I'm not sure which exactly. Nevertheless, you should not so quickly turn your nose up at gifts from the past, particularly as you seem to have lost your own. The twelfth doctor smiled condescendingly while casually wafting the sonic screwdriver in the air. I have sonic shades. How terribly hip of you, the first doctor snipped at him. I certainly would have no idea about such things. It's not like I spent any time in the sixties after all. The twelfth doctor scrunched his face in irritation. Whatever. Where did you put my shades? Well, 
I'm afraid they were lost when I dragged you back here. This statement was accompanied by another slight grinding noise. Lift your foot. No, not that foot, the other foot, the twelfth doctor ordered querulously. As the second foot was raised, the crumbled remains of the sonic shades were revealed. Razilon's rod, the twelfth doctor shouted, waving the sonic screwdriver. I guess I'll have to use this until I can find the time to upgrade. Now I believe you were leaving. Please, please don't let me stop you. The first doctor smiled coolly. Good luck and safe travels to you, my grumpy future self, he said before mounting the stairs. The doors whirred open as he approached, and without ever once looking back, he walked out into the snow and icy wind. The twelfth doctor returned his attention to the main console, specifically to one of the external view screens. He watched as the first doctor reached his TARDIS and disappeared within. In less than a minute, the device began to pulse in and out of view as it launched itself on a new journey in time and space. The ancient Time Lord now carelessly set the temporal and spatial coordinates at random for his own TARDIS and threw the launch lever. The central column began to rise and fall more quickly, lights flashing within, but before it had even completed one cycle, there was a crash and an ear-shredding screech as metal rending upon metal. With this, the TARDIS was also thrown, twisting violently to the left, then a moment later to the right. The Twelfth Doctor was forced to grip the central console with all his might to prevent him being flung wildly around the room. One view screen showed an image which only a Time Lord could easily interpret. Although it was greatly simplified for ease of use by that most powerful race, it was nevertheless a representation of the topology of space-time itself. And right now it was showing the impossible. The universe had shattered. Instead of one space-time, the universe was in shards, sections of space and time broken asunder and while still close, slowly but surely drifting apart. The point of origin of this disaster seemed to be the moment of the Twelfth Doctor's departure from the South Pole. The first doctor, as far as the view screen was able to make any comprehensible visualization, seemed to be in an adjacent fragment of space-time, but drifting ever farther away. As the twelfth doctor looked on in horror at this impossible vision of universal destruction, a communication screen now struggled hazily to life. Barely discernible through the snowstorm of static, the first doctor's face swam into view. His voice was similarly distorted when it came and he was only able to utter one sentence before the connection was lost forever. My dear doctor, did you leave something undone? Then the twelfth doctor was utterly alone in his TARDIS, adrift in a splinter of space and time. Masters, mistresses, the Doctor requires materials in order to maintain the TARDIS and ensure continued functionality. He similarly requires carbon-based comestibles to sustain his own biological functions and existence. Master would never say this, but he requires aid beyond that supplied by this unit in order to acquire these. To aid the Doctor in his various tasks and creations, this can be most effectively achieved via Patreon or Substack subscriptions, or through donations directly to PayPal. Or if you desire physical goods in return for your contributions, written accounts of my travels with the Doctor are also available on Amazon. 
Links are in the description below. Thank you, Masters, Mistresses.